right hello hello i thought i'd hop on here and give a a short teaching on prayer now this will probably be broken up into a couple of different parts so this will be part one now this is by no means a method on how to pray but i simply wanted to give some thoughts or keys as to how to approach prayer in fact it's how to approach a person and as I get older, I'm becoming less and less impressed by the rubrics of prayer, the what do I do, what does it look like, what's the run sheet for this prayer time. But this is for the person asking how do I approach prayer. In fact, I would say instead of all the methodology we can get tripped up on, just come and behold him. Just look at him and he will take care of the rest. So I would rephrase, how would I approach prayer? I'd rephrase that to how would I approach a person? Because at the end of the day, the aim is relationship with our Father and fellowship with Holy Spirit. So prayer is not just to God, it's with God. It's relationship, right? It's being with Him. It's not even about becoming a professional at it. When you're in love, right, when you're in love, you don't even care what it looks like. You just want to be with him. So there's no textbook answer for what it looks like for you. Just be with him and notice when your heart burns and yearns and is raptured by love, then stay there. It's natural conversing from beholding. So I have other resources I can get to you if you're interested. Just let me know. The resources will go into much greater depth and detail than I can in this recording. But straight out of the gates, prayer, I want to say that prayer does not mean asking God for things. Now, petitioning is a type of prayer. And the Lord wants us to ask of Him. But prayer is much more than just asking God to do things. Think of this. Why do we always have to be praying for X, Y, Z? Instead, why can't we just be praying because? Because of his goodness, because, of his, because we're in love, because we just want to talk with him. So, so I'd like to reframe our minds regarding prayer. And I'd like you to think of prayer as having a conversation with someone who knows you deeply. A person with whom you have a deep history of friendship with. So it's, it's when we approach prayer like that, that the rubrics begin to fade away. They don't really matter because we're just coming to be with our friend, right? So a simple definition I would hold to regarding prayer, and maybe it will reframe our minds around prayer, is that prayer is relationship. Prayer is relationship. It's dialogue, conversation, fellowship, friendship, not monologue, dialogue. It's both speaking and listening. And there are times when we pray prayers of petition, but what about prayers of thanksgiving, thanksgiving prayers? What about prayers of adoration or exaltation? What about just prayers expressing your love for God? So take a, take a marriage, for example. Would it not be weird if the extent of your relationship with your spouse consisted of them just asking you for things and never ever thanking or expressing thoughts or loving or cherishing or appreciating or cultivating friendship. We think that's strange in the natural, but many have a relationship with the Lord just like that. And this is a tragedy because they miss out on the whole point of prayer, which is to know God, right? We said that prayer is a relationship. It's all to know God. So, what about friendship with God, fellowship with the Holy Spirit? There's so much more. Eternal life, it says, is to know God. So prayer is a relationship. Prayer is not even a means to intercede. And this teaching is not even about how to get your prayers answered. Prayer is about just being with God. It's just about being with Him. Now, I wouldn't want to impose rules of prayer. Even saying that is, is distasteful to me. Rules of prayer. There are no rules of prayer because God is not a computer. He's a person. 
But there are things, having said that, to consider that may be helpful in getting our eyes onto him, especially if our souls are troubled. And one of them is we approach a person, the Father, with thanksgiving. We enter in through the gates of thanksgiving, Psalms 100 tells us, right? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Now we can approach God always and in vulnerability, but when we choose to come with a sacrifice of thanksgiving, we're able to see him clearer. And I call it a sacrifice of thanksgiving because it, it's hard, it's costly, it costs you something, especially if you're in pain and don't feel like being thankful. We can come to him in our pain and in the midst of it all, in the midst of pain, all we may be able to bring him is Psalm 147, verse 3. Lord, heal my broken heart. Bandage these wounds. And if you're being real, it's really hard to be thankful in pain naturally. It's hard to give him thanks in our pain. But that's why it's called a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It costs something. And it's because it's hard. But this is, think of this, this is the only age on this side of eternity. It's the only time in which we can, in the midst of pain, still choose him. And instead of, Lord, heal my broken heart, bandage my wounds, we can, by grace, pray, thank you that you heal my heart. Thank you that you bandage my wounds. It just postures our hearts. It, it postures our hearts to hope. Yeah, Thanksgiving postures our hearts to hope. So in the midst of deepest pain, we can pray, thank you that you heal my heart. Thank you. These two words, thank you that you bandage my wounds. And our tears are precious to him. He knows the weight behind each teardrop. And he wants us to bring the pain to him. So thanksgiving gets our eyes off of us and pushes our hearts before the Lord. And God doesn't need our thanksgiving to fill some narcissistic void. He has been fine for eternity before us. But thanksgiving is healthy for our hearts because it softens our hearts to his voice, to his presence. And that is home ground for our hearts. That's where our hearts are most happy. It's where our hearts were designed to dwell. So remember, we're not, we're, we are coming to a person, not a computer, where we enter in commands and get an output. And again, because thanksgiving is a choice, it's an, it's an act of your will to choose to steer your soul, command your soul to give thanks. So it, it, it may be helpful to meditate on things the Lord has done, a testimony of His goodness, of His grace, that it's meaningful to your heart just to posture you in thanksgiving, to bring your soul into captivity. To thanksgiving if you need a reason to thank him thank him that you can even thank him he did a lot for us to call him father and it's only by the blood that we have a relationship with god there's no way to god we know this there's no way to god except for this holy escalator called the blood of jesus <laughs> he alone has made the way and this is the reason we can approach him boldly the veil is torn the blood speaks a better word over us than accusations and lies we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood. So all of these things are reasons to thank him. And I want you to remember this phrase in prayer. It's this, by your blood into your presence. This is the only means of entering into his presence. The blood is sufficient enough for us to fellowship. And this is so freeing because it's not up to us. He'll, he has <laughs> he has already made full provision for us to enter into fellowship with him. And the fitting response, not under legalism, but love, is these two words. Thank you. <laughs> A simple definition for thanksgiving I hold to is this. That thanksgiving is a response prompted by remembering and agreeing with what God has done and who he is. I'll say it again. A definition for thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a response prompted
prompted by remembering and agreeing with what God has done and who he is. So if I remember what he has done and remember who he is, and if I let myself marinate there and meditate there, the response of my heart in agreement will be thank you. If I allow myself to sit there for a bit until my heart begins to stir with these two words, thank you. It's a natural response to meditating on and remembering. For example, if even this moment I want to look at how God orchestrates my life and orchestrates life in me and the journey of redemption in my life, and if I want to meditate on the faithfulness of God, the affection in my heart begins to stir and an automatic response of my heart is thank you, God. You are faithful. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for loving me. So we never have to force a thank you. It's said in love. Spend hours and hours in intentionally beholding and remembering. We never graduate from it. And this is where I will end part one.